Amen. Amen. What a feast today. Thank you, Anita. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Dan. As I took my ordination vows, I recognized that um, the vows I was taking were not just to uh, one group of people. Uh, we're, we're, we're not just two particular human leaders, uh, but the vows that I was making were to Christ and to his church. And, uh, and, and I, I realized in the moment what a high calling that is and what a big deal that is to, to, to take those vows. It, it's kind of like marriage, right? Marriage vows. It's, it's the for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, for in sickness and in health. Um, that, that uh, my call is, is to serve Christ in his church, whatever season we find ourselves in. And uh, one, one of the greatest uh, joys in all of this has just been to have um, so many, uh, all of you, really, standing behind me, supporting me, encouraging me as I take those vows. And, and I don't think I could have done it without all of you. Of course, my family, my lovely wife, Elena, and our kids. Uh, you saw Amy on the morning that I uh, shared about my ordination. I wore my soul for the first time. She came running up here because she understood that she's a part of that call, too. Uh, but what a privilege it is um, to serve with the staff here, with Dan and with Janine and with Lisa, uh, and now with Pastor Michelle as well. So glad to have you on board. Um, what, what a joy to serve with our leadership. We have a good, a good uh, team of leaders right now that care deeply and take the work that they do seriously. Chris, for all your time and work and support uh, for walking with me, I'm, I'm just indebted to you and to our whole leadership team. Um, I thank you all. Um, and, uh, and, and for this church. For the ways that you have cared for me and supported me and encouraged me, I thank you. And for Pastor Debbie Blue, uh, who's here today, and uh, what a gift it is to have her with us today. Some of you don't know her. Uh, she, she has been a, a trailblazing leader in our denomination for many years. And I've been able to uh, appreciate and admire her leadership from a distance for many years and uh, just humbled that she was willing to say yes to be my ordination mentor. So Pastor Debbie, thank you. Thank you for being here today. Um, as, as you prayed for me, as, as you all laid your hands on me, as th this was the piece that was missing from my ordination service. Because you all, though you were not physically there uh, in presence, uh, you are a huge part of, of this call. So I thank you all. Um, and it is, it is a privilege to serve uh, a, a gracious and loving and supportive family. So thank you. This week I was flipping through my Facebook feed and I came across a picture of somebody that I hadn't seen in many years and I had kind of forgotten somewhere in the back of my mind I knew that she was serving in, uh, in, as, a, uh, as an aide in Washington, D.C. And it was a picture of her standing with this man who was all dressed up in a suit and, and I didn't know who he was but I could see by the look on her face like she, she was just excited beyond belief, right? It's kind of that like wide-eyed, like electricity, like big smile, like excitement mixed with like kind of scared, right? She'd had a brush with greatness, a brush with, uh, with she, she had an opportunity to meet one of the representatives, U.S. representatives, who I, I don't know by name or face, but she had admired him from a distance, and, and suddenly she had an opportunity to meet him, to talk with him, to, uh, to have her picture taken with him. It's a brush with greatness, have any of you had an experience like that where you meet somebody that you've admired from a distance for a long time? Maybe it's an athlete or a leader or an author. Maybe it's a musician or, or whoever. Somebody that you uh, just, just think of in high esteem. Somebody who's famous. Maybe you run into him at the airport. And you know that feeling that you get when you see him? You're like, oh my gosh, is that... Uh, fill in the blank. Brad Pitt, right? Is that Brad Pitt over? Should I go over? Should I say hi? Like you want to get a selfie with him? When I was in high uh, college, I, one of my favorite bands was Switchfoot, the group Switchfoot. And, uh, and I actually got to see them twice in the same year uh, and on, on the same tour, once in Chicago and once in Buffalo, New York. And during the Buffalo uh, concert, we were there at this venue. It was really cool. The, the stage was kind of down below, and then there was tiered seating, a couple different layers up. So, so there was the, the floor, kind of the mosh pit area, and then there was a ring around that a few steps higher, and then behind that, another ring. And we were on that, that second ring, a ways back, pretty much in, in the back of, of that section of the, of the uh, auditorium. And I was loving the concert. It was so good. And we were in the middle of it. And uh, they started playing one of my favorite songs at the time. And their lead singer, John Foreman, just like sits down uh, on the stage and he's singing his heart out. And I'm just loving this moment. 
And, and then he starts uh, on, on uh, walking off the stage and moving around. So if the stage is here and I'm over here, he starts walking over this way. And, and, and he's circling around. And uh, he's on the, the level above me. And so he's circling around, continuing to sing. And then just as the band is like cranking it up and we're getting to the bridge of the song, I, I turn around and, and, and the people were standing behind me, right behind a railing. They suddenly part. And, and I look up and there's John foreman right behind me and, and then he he crouches up onto the railing and he stands there like this and he looks straight down into my face and here I am looking straight up into the face of John foreman and he's singing his heart out and I'm singing my heart out and and it's the middle of the concert and he's got this long stringy hair and he's all sweaty so his sweat is just <laughs> dripping onto me and then, and, and then he looks up again, and I realize he's having a hard time standing there, so I throw up my hand, and he grabs my hand, and he stands there and holds my hand for the rest of the song. A brush with greatness. <laughs> right? A brush with greatness. My heart was pumping. My veins were pumping. I don't know that I've ever sing that, sung that loud in my life, right? You know what it's like to have a brush with greatness? Another time I had an opportunity to drive, actually drive around the front man of another band that I love. And, and there I found myself both excited but also super nervous. And suddenly I lost the ability to put together coherent sentences. And I literally took two wrong turns that took us about a half an hour out of our way because I just, I just lost myself in that moment. Do you know what that's like? Do you know what that's like? There's, there's a, a moment in, in that wonderful bit of Americana from 1992, Wayne's World. Have any of you heard that? Let's, let, let's watch that here. We got to get going. No, no, no. Stick around. Hang out with us. Cool. Yeah, we'll stay and hang around with you. <laughs> with Alice Cooper. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! We're not worthy! We're scum! We suck! <laughs> you know that moment when you have a brush? with greatness. Alice Cooper, th this was just the perfect clip, right? Because it takes place in Aurora. And last I knew, Alice Cooper is actually a covenanter. He goes to a covenant church, right? So in real life, he wouldn't let anybody bow down to him. Don't worry. But that experience, that brush with greatness, we're, we're, we're just kind of electric inside. And, and we don't know what to do with it all. And it's nervous mix, mix, mixed with excitement, mixed with, mix, mixed with just we're not sure what to do anymore. As I was sitting with a text this morning, I, I, was, uh, I, I was just remarkably struck by the way that this passage talks about this. Chapter 4, verse 16 says this, Then let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Now, some of you may have found that famous person that you love and approached them with confidence. And, and I, hats off to you, that's not me. I'm full of nervousness. But, but I think it's a very different thing to approach a famous person, a human being, somebody who has a family and bills to pay and garbage to take out at the end of the week, right? To approach them with confidence versus approaching the throne of God's grace with confidence confidence? At first blush, it almost seems arrogant to say that we would approach the throne of grace with confidence, doesn't it? And yet, that is the word that Hebrews has with us here. What does it mean to approach that throne of grace with confidence? We read through scripture and we hear different encounters that people have with, with God and his power and, and his majesty, his glory in the temple. Uh, Isaiah was, was in the temple. He was in, in a vision. He was in the temple and the, the, uh, the train of God's robe filled the temple. His glory was filling this place. Came into God's presence. And what was his reaction? There at the throne of God, he says, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips. In scripture, people don't on their own approach God's throne with confidence. No, we approach God's throne with trepidation, with trembling. Because in, in the presence of God's holiness, we're aware of how broken and how, how, how imperfect we are. 
And so we come, we say, woe is me, woe is me. God offers Isaiah the cleansing for his lips, the coal that cleanses, cleanses his lips so that he may stand in the presence of God, of God. But on his own, he does not stand with confidence. On our own, what do we do? Flip back to the beginning of the story. Adam and Eve in the garden after they had gone against God's will and, and, and they found themselves in sin and they felt that shame. What did they do when, when God came walking through the garden? They hid, right? They heard the glory of God coming and they hid away. And yet Hebrews says we can approach the throne of God with confidence particularly for the Hebrew people. I think this would have been a hard, a hard pill to swallow. You caught the part at the end of this passage where the author of Hebrews takes them to task, didn't you? To, to, to frame this up a little bit, we've been a few weeks now in our series in Hebrews and the, the people to whom this book was written, they were uh, a ways down the road in their faith, but they were kind of waffling. They were unsure. That some of them were walking away from the faith and so the writer of Hebrews writes to encourage them to build up their faith, to give them a deeper understanding. But here, in the middle of his argument, the author of Hebrews breaks away from the flow of, of, of his uh, argument and he says this, we have much to say about these things, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you're, you no longer even try to understand. Some translations say you're sluggish in your hearing. You're, 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 you've gotten lazy. You're not really trying anymore. And so your faith is dying. For, for people for whom this is true, who are maybe on the edge of, do I stay committed to Christ or not? Do, do I pay the cost that it costs me to follow Christ? Or do I walk away to come before the throne of grace? You would not come with confidence, would you? Maybe that's some of you here this morning, right? Not sure if you're coming to church even this morning. Maybe so, maybe not. What would it be like to come before the throne of God? Can, can we all just close our eyes for a moment? And, and picture what that would be like to approach the throne of grace. The glory of the Lord filling the space. What are you feeling in that place? Awe and wonder. Shame and guilt. You're standing all by yourself. What are you feeling in that place? My friends, when, when we come into an encounter with God, if we are on our own, I think our only reaction can be to say, we're not worthy. We are not worthy. We're not worthy to stand even in the throne room, even in the back, even on the side, much less approach the throne of grace with confidence. We're not worthy except... For Jesus Christ, our high priest. And that is the point of this, of this passage here, is that Christ has done something that has changed the game entirely and, and that allows us to change our posture as we come into an encounter with God. And so we're going to dig into this passage and the imagery that's here this morning. And this passage presents a, a version, a symbolized version of the office of the high priest in the Old Testament. Now, before we dive in, I want to just say today, this is not milk, okay? This is solid food. Just, just, as, just as the author of, of Hebrews said, by this time you should be teachers, you, but now you need somebody to teach you the elementary truths all over again. You need milk, not solid food. What he wants to offer them is the solid food. And, and there are bits of scripture like this one that are complex and difficult to understand. And there are concepts and backgrounds that most of us don't have access to on, on a regular basis, maybe in our study Bibles or something. But, but the easy thing to do when we pick it up and read in that part of scripture or, or when we hear it read on a Sunday morning, the easy thing to do is just kind of let our eyes glaze over and move on to the next part that says something we understand, right? But, but aren't we just doing the same thing that the Hebrews were doing? We've gotten sluggish in our hearing. So, so I, I want to encourage you that, that this is a place where we need to dig in. When we come up against something that's hard or obscure, we, 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 need, to, we need to plumb deeper into our faith so that our faith would not, would not fade away so that our faith wouldn't just be dying embers, 
but that it would be a roaring fire sharing light and heat for all those around us. That's what's before us here today. This is solid food. I pray that you'll hang with me and, uh, and, and try to track with me and maybe even sit with this text yourself later this afternoon. So the Old Testament uh, talks about the system of priests and sacrifices that are made um, to, to purify the people, to allow the people to come before God as, um, as they are. As, as a random aside, when I was at camp, I, I was teaching uh, elementary school kids, third through fifth grade, I think. And one week, we decided we're going to do a study in the book of Leviticus, and we're going to make the kids memorize every type of sacrifice and what it was for and when it was offered and so on and so forth. This part of Hebrews can feel a little bit like that, like, why do I need to know this, right? Right? And yet, if we understand that background, it helps us understand who Christ is, what he's done, and, and then how we respond, right? Which is what we'll get to at the end. So the system of sacrifices was complex, but the high priest was put into place as a leader over the people. The high priest, uh, Hebrews tells us, was called out from among the people, and, and the high priest was set aside for matters pertaining to God. So you have here on the one hand, the, from among the people and pertaining to God, the high priest is a mediator between heaven and earth, between God and God's people. The high priest has to navigate this complex system of sacrifices, and here Hebrews focuses on one thing, sacrifices that are made for sin. He's probably referring to what happened on the Day of Atonement once a year. Uh, th there were sacrifices that were offered. There was a scapegoat that was sent out into the wilderness. But the, the culmination of it all was when the high priest would enter the innermost chamber of the temple, the Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The, the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is known as the mercy seat, right? So he, he's approaching the throne of God. This is the place where God's presence dwells. So the high priest was the only one who was allowed to enter that space, and only once a year. And when he came in, he had to offer sacrifices and blood, it, and, and, and the blood would be sprinkled in this space to offer atonement for himself, for his own sins, and for the sins of the people. And thus, the, the high priest was able to, uh, to communicate between God and his people and offer sacrifices for sin. Now, Hebrews tells us that this, this high priest is able to deal gently with God's people because he knows what it's like to be human. Because he himself is weak. And when we're talking about the Old Testament, he himself is sinful. He himself needs sacrifices to be made on his behalf. Finally, he doesn't take this honor of high priest upon himself, but instead he receives it when he's called by God. Any true leader, I think, receives that calling, doesn't take it upon themselves. And so we have this symbolized version of what happened in the Old Testament. And then Hebrews jumps ahead to say Jesus Christ is not just a continuation of what has happened, but he's the fulfillment of that symbol. He is, he's brought it to its culmination. So here, here again we hear uh, God calling to Jesus in the words of the Psalms, you are my son, today I become your father. And in another place God says you, and here Hebrews is saying this is about Jesus, you are a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And if you're not familiar with Melchizedek, you're probably like Melchizedek who? right? He's an obscure person from the Old Testament, book of Genesis. Uh, he, he's a priest from Salem. He comes out of the wilderness, meets Abraham. Abraham gives him one-tenth of everything he owns, and, and Melchizedek offers sacrifices on behalf of Abraham. Hebrews says, this is the line that Christ comes from, this man who comes out of the wilderness and then fades out of the, out of the view of our story. Christ is a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an ending. And, and, and so he follows not in, in, human, uh, in a human line, but in a divine line. So he fulfills this, this position of high priest, called by God, a high priest not just for his lifetime, but forever in the order of Melchizedek. And what does he do as high priest? He offers up not sacrifices, uh, but prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. All throughout his ministry, we see Jesus going into prayer. These were his offering to God. This is the way that he made atonement for his people while he was still on this earth. We got a, caught a glimpse of that even there um, at, on the, the last day uh, before his crucifixion in the garden, offering his prayers uh, as an as a offering to God. 
And here it says something interesting. Verse 8 says, Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. What does this mean for Jesus Christ to learn obedience? We touched on this a little bit last week. The suffering that Christ endured somehow uh, uh, brought him into a fuller completion of, of really who he already was by nature. Track with me here. It was important that Jesus didn't just zap down from heaven, die on the cross for our sins, and then go back up, right? Or, or even that, it, it wasn't just that Jesus would come again, uh, as we're waiting for now, and establish the kingdom on earth. There was a work that had to be done here, a suffering that Christ had to endure, so that he might learn what it fully means uh, to be who he already is. I know that's, that's a little complex, but uh, N.T. Wright says it this way, um, he needed to learn so that he could become who he already was by his nature. He was, by nature, he was a son already, but he learned obedience by what he suffered. And here, the suffering is not just what happened on the cross, but, but his whole life, his enduring of temptations, as we heard here, which is its own kind of suffering. He did not succumb to sin, uh, but, but he suffered the temptations, right? And, and all the way through his ministry, we see that Christ suffers. But what could this possibly mean? I came across an illustration that helped me understand this. There's a story about a man, a businessman, and his son. And this businessman was getting a little older on in years, and his son had just completed his school, so he decided he was going to hand the business, he was going to hand the business off to his son. Now, his son could have just moved into the executive office and taken over the company, but his father knew that that was not a wise thing to do. So before he even gave him an office, this son was first, uh, he had to work in raw materials and learn about what it meant to acquire the stuff that they needed to make what they were making. He worked on the assembly line so that he would know what was happening there, what it was like to be in that place. He worked in finance so that he understood the numbers that would sustain the business. He worked even as a salesman who went out and, and understood the, the acceptance and the rejection and, and how difficult it was uh, to sell the products to people who were uh, suspicious of what they were offering. And only then... Only then was he given an office and leadership in the company. He was already the son. He was already the heir to the company. But not until he went through, so to speak, the suffering, not until he had stood in the people's shoes, was he ready to lead the people where they needed to go. That's what Christ has done for us. That's what Christ has done for us. He was by nature a son, but he learned obedient through, obedience through what he suffered. And he came down so that he could learn the heights and depths of creation, the joys and the sorrows as well. And, and riding the ups and downs will mean suffering. And that's not because God is a sadist or he wants his son to suffer. But, but that's because this world that God has created and loves and will not let go of is sometimes a dark and wicked place. And if Christ is going to fully know what it means to stand in our shoes, he's going to have to suffer. And he did that perfectly and completely. And in a way that wasn't just suffering on top of suffering, that made a way through that suffering, even through death, to life abundant and freedom from pain and all that we see laid out in, in the book of Revelation, chapters 21, 22. This is why it's so crucial that Jesus is both son and human being. He's both fully God and fully human. He's perfect in his humanity and perfect in his divinity. Because if he did not know both fully, completely, perfectly, we are without a savior. We are without one who truly knows what it is to live where we are. We're without one who can deal with us with gentleness and with patience who can truly empathize or sympathize, right? We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize or empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who knows all of it. He's been there. He's done that. And so he treats us graciously and, and patiently. And even when we're slow to, to hear and slow to understand, even when we're not really trying to understand all that much, he still invites us along. He still invites us to come. 
to learn from him, to learn goodness and righteousness and the way that leads to life. And so we find that approaching God's throne with confidence isn't really all that much about us at all. It's not my confidence. It's not self-confidence. To approach God's throne with self-confidence, that would be the epitome of arrogance, would it not? But we approach the throne not with self-confidence, but with Christ's confidence. With confidence in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Not only what he has done, but who he is. Who he has embodied. He has, he, he has been uh, uh, within us. He knows our experience. And, and so we approach that throne with confidence because we know that our high priest is right there. Seated on the right hand of the throne. He's there with compassion and empathy and sympathy for us in whatever experience we might have standing there. This is why we come before our God not in trembling and fear. Well, there's a little bit of awe mixed in with it, is there not? But we come in faith. We come not bracing for our punishment, for what we've done, but we come actually hoping for mercy. We come not hiding in our shame, but we come looking for grace, the gift that we do not deserve. On our own, we are not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. But in him, we are worthy. And that is a miracle and an incredible gift. We come to the throne with confidence only through Jesus Christ, our high priest. Coming to the throne of God is more than just a brush with greatness, is it not? It's more than just a moment, a fleeting moment, and then the moment is gone. When we come to the throne of grace with confidence, we come to receive that grace and mercy and then to step into the life that God has prepared for us, into the wide expanses of God's grace. And it's in that place where we find that God has more in mind for us than just not going to hell, okay? He has more in mind for us than just our own lives existing beyond death. Our salvation, the salvation that Christ has has come to mediate, it's about so much more than us in our individual lives. It's about the redemption of all of creation. It's about the story of of goodness and salvation that God has been telling from the beginning. He invites us into that. That's, That's a compelling reason to approach the throne of grace. So the question is, will we keep hiding? Will we keep hiding? Will we try to sneak into the back of God's throne room and sit in the back pew hoping he doesn't call on us? Or will we approach the throne of grace with confidence? Christ has done it all. We can have confidence in what he has done, in who he is, regardless of of how good we are or how bad we are, regardless of what we've done or what we've thought, regardless of the shame or the guilt that weighs us down. We're invited to come to the throne to receive mercy, to receive grace, to receive all that we need through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when the going gets tough, when we're tempted to give up our faith, when doubt overwhelms or the persecution just becomes too much and we're ready to walk away, when the embers of our faith are nearly snuffed out, can we remember that we have a high priest who knows what it is to stand in our shoes? He understands the temptation to get up and run away. That's what is happening in that garden. He understands all of it. And he empathizes with us. He sympathizes with us. He's been tempted by those same temptations. Jesus knows all of it. And he's standing right there with us. So friends, every day is an invitation, an opportunity to approach the throne of grace with confidence, to find forgiveness for the things that we've done, the the burdens we carry, to find a calling into a life that is so much greater than anything we could conceive on our own. But the question is, will we come? Will we come? I pray that you will. Let's pray together. God, we just give you praise and glory today for all that you have done for us. God, we know that we are not worthy. We are not worthy. We do not belong in front of your throne. And yet you welcome us to come. Jesus, we give you all the praise and the glory for what you have gone through, for who you are, for inviting us into your life, oh Jesus. 
So we want our lives to be an act of worship, to be a, a giving of glory back to you for all you have done. God, would you fill us with your confidence to approach that throne, to receive what we need? God, would you fill us with confidence to be your light, to go deeper in our faith, to fan the flames of our faith higher and higher? God, would you give us the confidence we need to live this life in hope and confidence assurance that you are indeed making all things new, us included. So Jesus, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise, both today and forevermore, to you and to the Holy Spirit and the, and the Father as well. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.